Dr. Sage here. Today I'm going to give you my introduction to science and we're going to cover chapter one. So why am I giving you a separate introduction to science in addition to what your textbook covers as its introduction to science? Well the reason is because this is going to be your first, for most of you at least, your first real introduction into a science course at the college level. And unfortunately, there's a lot of misunderstandings among the general public about the way science is done, like how you do science, what is considered valid evidence for science, and even the terminology, like some of the words that are used in science are misunderstood among the general public. So because of that, I think it's very important to give you a little introduction to science itself. Now, to begin introducing this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the types of evidence that are considered valid evidence for science. And I actually took this information from another faculty. So this was a faculty member at UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, and he was a research faculty member. So he was doing lots of scientific research. And the scientific research that he was uh, studying was about aging. Um, so what actually causes aging itself and what can be done to delay the incidence of the age associated diseases. Things like um, most cancers are age associated, heart disease, um, things, uh, Alzheimer's, things like that. Um, so he was studying an intervention that was shown to extend both lifespan by about 30%, so like make organisms live about 30% longer, and health span. So you didn't just live longer, you lived healthier. There was less incidence of things like, you know, cancer, heart disease, etc. And this was shown to work in basically every species that's been tested in. That'd be things like yeast and worms and flies and mice and rats and dogs, possibly in monkeys. The, the rhesus monkey study is 100% clear. But basically every study, every animal has been tested in, it's been shown to work. So it most likely would also do the same thing in humans. So a lot of humans might be interested, what can make me live not just longer, but healthier? Less chance of getting, or at least delayed chance of getting things like cancer and heart disease. Um, but unfortunately, when a scientist does their research, they publish that research in a scientific research paper, which is not written for the general public. Okay, there's just too much jargon, too many technical terms, and unless you're another scientist, you won't be able to read and understand the paper. So what he did is he wrote a book about the research on aging that he was studying for the general public, because a lot of people might be interested in the scientific research on it. Now, when he started that book, he started by giving a description of what's considered valid evidence for science. And before he did that, he started out by first saying, and I'll say the same thing, what he was talking about, what I'm going to be talking about, is anything that science can evaluate. So any scientific or material claim. So for example, like uh, which fertilizer is going to help your rose bushes to grow larger? Or this new herbal supplement, is it going to be good for people who have arthritis? Those are things that science can evaluate. But not everything in life falls under the realm of science. For example, ethics or religion or beauty are outside the realm of science. I cannot say that a certain painting is the most beautiful painting that's ever been made. I can't scientifically say that because science can't evaluate beauty. Okay, so we're going to be talking about things that science can evaluate. So there are four potential categories of evidence, which is called testimonial, argumentative, which doesn't mean I'm trying to argue with you, it means I'm trying to make the case for something, correlational, and experimental. And what I'm going to show you over the next four slides is the only type of evidence that's actually considered valid for science is experimental evidence. Okay, so the first type of evidence uh, that you might hear about is called testimonial evidence. Now, testimonial evidence, that is often what you'll hear when somebody's trying to sell you something. Like you're up late at night watching some infomercial on TV and they're trying to get you to buy this new herbal supplement. Okay, And what do they do? Well, they get like 50 people to come in front of the camera and say, you know, I took this new herbal supplement and my arthritis went away. My joints don't hurt anymore. Or I took this new herbal supplement and I feel 10 years younger. 
or I took this new herbal supplement and I instantly lost 20 pounds. Okay, that's testimonial evidence. Testimonial evidence is not valid for science. Why? Because it's highly unreliable. They don't tell you about the people who took their new herbal supplement and didn't get any better. They also don't tell you about the people who didn't take the new herbal supplement and got better anyway. Okay, so testimony evidence is highly unreliable. So because of that, it's not considered valid evidence for science. Now, it's not necessarily wrong. Maybe this new herbal supplement will help your joints to feel better. But testimony alone is not valid for science. Second type of potential evidence is called argumentative evidence. Okay, again, that doesn't mean you're trying to argue with somebody. It means you're trying to make the case for something. So basically what this is saying is, let's say you know fact A and you know fact B. And you say, since I know fact A and fact B, C must be true. Okay, so the example he gave in the book was exercise increases HDL, high density lipoprotein. So that's a fact. High HDL is usually associated with lower degrees of ulterior sclerosis. So that's a fact. So what you might say is since exercise increases HDL and HDL lowers ulterior sclerosis, exercise should reduce your chance of getting a heart attack. It should be good for your heart. And that's a very logical argument. It makes sense, but it's not enough for science. Maybe while exercise is increasing your HDL that should be good for your heart, maybe at the same time it's damaging your heart muscle, which is bad for your heart. Okay, so you can't just make the arguments. In science, you actually have to directly demonstrate it. Now let me pause the lecture for a second because I don't want anyone going home and saying, Dr. Sage said exercise is bad for my heart. Okay, that is definitely not what I'm saying. Obviously, cardiovascular exercise is very good for your cardiovascular system. What I'm saying is argumentative evidence alone is not valid for science. Third type of potential evidence is called correlational evidence. This is basically any time that two things happen at the same time, you say, well, one must cause the other. So every time A happens, B happens. Okay, every single time A happens, B happens, well, then A must cause B. Okay, that's correlational evidence. Okay, but again, that's not valid for science. So the example that he gave in the book is from California because he lived in California. But in California, when the Santa Ana wind blows, a lot of people get hay fever. When the Santa Ana wind blows, there's also an increase in air pressure or barometric pressure. So every time there's an increase in air pressure, there's an increase in hay fever. So you might say, well, obviously air pressure causes hay fever, but that would be wrong. What's actually happening is when the Santa Ana wind blows, it increases air pressure. But when the Santa Ana wind blows, it also blows on pollen, and pollen is what causes the hay fever. Okay, so just because two things are happening at the same time does not necessarily mean one causes the other. The more formal way we say this in science is correlation is not necessarily causation. So the only type of evidence that's actually considered valid evidence for science is experimental evidence. Okay, this is where you are testing a hypothesis more than once under appropriate control conditions. All right, now that didn't really make any sense because I haven't taught you those terms yet. Like what is a hypothesis? What's a control condition? Basically what that's saying is every time you do A, it directly causes B to happen. And you don't just do it once. Every single time you do A, it directly causes B to happen. And it doesn't matter if I do it or if you do it or if a scientist in a lab in England or India does it. Every single time you do A, it directly causes B to happen. With the appropriate controls, that's called experimental evidence. Now, that one's still a little vague, so I need to explain that one better. But before I can explain it better, I need to teach you some of those terms. For example, hypothesis. So what is a hypothesis? Well, a hypothesis is a testable proposed explanation for something that you can observe. All right, that still sounds a little bit confusing. Let me simplify that. A hypothesis is your best guess. A hypothesis is what you think is happening. 
and it has the ability to be tested. That's what a hypothesis is. All right, so again, I'm going to explain that better, but before I do, there's a couple more terms you need to understand, and those are variables. Anything that can change in an experiment is called a variable. The two main variables are called the independent variable and the dependent variable. The independent variable is a variable that you are intentionally changing in the experiment, whereas the dependent variable is a variable that you are measuring in the experiment. All right, so still confusing. So let me put those last like five slides together and explain it with some examples. All right, so these are examples of hypotheses. So here's a hypothesis. I think that if you raise the temperature of a cup of water, more sugar will dissolve in the water. Okay, that's my hypothesis. And that's a valid scientific hypothesis. It's obviously a very simplistic one, but it's a valid hypothesis. Why? Because it's my best guess is what I think is going to happen. And it has the ability to be tested. I can easily test that. I can get hot water and cold water and see which one more sugar will dissolve in. Now, in that hypothesis, we also have the variables. The independent variable, that's the thing that you are intentionally changing in the experiment, that's the temperature of the water. The dependent variable, that's the thing you're measuring for changes, that's how much sugar is dissolving in the water. Okay, another example. I think that if a plant receives fertilizer, it will grow bigger than a plant that does not receive fertilizer. That's a valid hypothesis. It's my best guess is what I think is going to happen, and it's testable. Okay, independent variable, the thing I'm changing, fertilizer or no fertilizer. Dependent variable, the thing I'm measuring, how tall does the plant grow? All right, last example. I think if I put fenders on a bicycle, it will keep the bike rider more dry when they ride through puddles compared to a bike that doesn't have fenders. Okay, so my best guess is what I think is going to happen. I can easily test it. That's a valid scientific hypothesis. Independent variable, the thing I'm changing, bike with fenders versus bike with no fenders. Dependent variable, the thing I'm measuring, how wet does a bike rider get? Okay, so that's what a hypothesis is. Okay, it's a test for a proposed explanation for something you can observe, or in simpler terms, it's what you think is happening. It's your best guess, and it has the ability to be tested. Okay, so what do you do with a hypothesis? Well, you test it with an experiment. And if you're doing good science, what you're going to do is called a controlled experiment. A controlled experiment is an experiment which only one variable, the independent variable, is intentionally changed at a time. Another variable, the dependent variable, is measured for changes but everything else is kept constant or not changing. Okay, so let me explain that one. So um, another example, let's say that I want to do an experiment where I want to test which brand of fertilizer, like fertilizer A, fertilizer B, or fertilizer C, does a better job of helping my plants to grow. Okay, so in that experiment, one thing should be changing. That's the independent variable. That would be fertilizer A, B, or C. Another thing should be changing. That's a dependent variable. That's what I'm measuring. That's how tall the plants are growing. But everything else should be exactly the same. For example, I cannot put fertilizer A on a tomato plant and fertilizer B on an oak tree. Okay, that would not be a valid scientific experiment. Why? Because those two plants, they might grow at different rates. So what I have to do is I have to keep everything constant or the same for all three fertilizer, A, B, and C, all three plants. All three plants must be the same species of plant. All three plants must start out at the same age. All three plants must start out at the same height. All three plants must be in the same size pot. All three plants have to have the exact same type of soil. All three plants have to receive the same amount of water every day. All three plants have to receive the same amount of sunlight every day. All three plants have to be kept at the same temperature room every day. Everything is exactly the same, except the thing I am intentionally changing, that's the independent variable, that's fertilizer A, B, or C, and the thing I'm measuring for change, that's a dependent variable, that's how tall the plant is growing. That is a controlled experiment, okay? And that's what you want to do in science. Now, if you're doing a real controlled experiment in science, you're also going to add two control groups. Now, 
Those are called negative controls and positive controls. So I'm going to explain, or no, I'm, I'm going to read their definitions, which honestly it will probably not make sense and sound confusing. And then I'll explain what the definitions mean with an example. So a negative control confirms that the procedure is not observing an unrelated effect, so it minimizes false positives. Positive control does the opposite. It confirms that the procedure is competent in observing the effect, so it minimizes false negatives. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? So let's say that I do another experiment. And in this experiment, I have a tile floor, and I want to test which brand of floor cleaner, like Pine Saw, Fabuloso, or Mr. Clean, does a better job of cleaning that tile floor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get three buckets. I'm going to add water to the three buckets. I'm going to put mops in the three buckets. And in one bucket, bucket I'm going to add Pine Salt. Another, I'm going to add Fabuloso. Another, I'm going to add Mr. Clean. And then I'm going to clean three sections of the tile floor with those three buckets. Now, let's say that I do that and all three sections get perfectly clean. Okay. They are all equally clean. They all did a great job of cleaning that tile floor. Okay, so what would I probably conclude? What would you probably conclude? Well, obviously all three floor cleaners are doing a great job of cleaning the tile floor. However, that could actually be a false positive. Okay, what if it turns out that the chemicals had nothing to do with the floor getting clean? What if it turns out that the reason the floor was clean was because I was physically scrubbing the floor with the mop. Okay, well, I wasn't trying to test the mop. I wasn't trying to see if a mop and water can clean the floor. I was trying to test the chemicals. So what does that mean? That means I screwed up. I made a mistake. I was not testing what I was trying to test. I was trying to test the chemicals, but instead I was testing physically scrubbing the floor with a mop. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to add a negative control, okay? A negative control is something that should give you a negative result. It should not give you the thing you are looking for. So in this case, I'm looking for a clean floor by a chemical cleaning. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a fourth bucket. Okay, bucket number four is just going to be a bucket with water and a mop, no chemicals added. Now, if the water mop bucket cleans the floor, then I know I made a mistake because I wasn't trying to test the physical scrubbing of the floor with the mop. But if the water mop bucket does not clean the floor, however, the bucket with pine sole in it does clean the floor, then I know I designed my experiment correctly and pine sole is doing a good job cleaning the floor. Because the only difference between bucket water mop and bucket water mop pine saw, the only difference is the pine saw. So if the water bucket doesn't clean the floor, but the pine saw does, <clears throat> then I know I did my experiment correctly and pine saw is doing a good job cleaning the floor. So that water bucket, that's a negative control. It does not give you the thing you're looking for. I'm looking for a clean floor. The water bucket does not clean the floor. All right. So another example of a negative control you might have heard of before, especially for you pre-health related majors out there, is a placebo. Okay, so a placebo is another type of negative control. So what is a placebo? Well, let's say you're working for a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to develop a new drug that you think is going to help people who have cancer. Okay, what you're going to do is you're going to give, uh, you know, like 200 people this new drug and you're gonna give like 200 people a placebo, which is like a sugar pill. So if the people who are taking the new drug get better, but the people taking the placebo do not get better, then you know your new drug is actually having an effect. It's helping people. So that placebo, that sugar pill, that's a negative control. Okay, so that's what a negative control is. How about a positive control? So let's say I do my experiment again where I'm trying to clean the floor. So I have my water bucket, and then I have my three buckets that have Pine Salt Fabuloso and Mr. Clean. And I clean four sections of the floor, and it turns out none of them get clean. They are all still dirty. Well, what would I probably conclude? I would probably conclude, well, the chemicals are not doing a good job cleaning the floor. The floor is still dirty, so obviously they're not doing a good job cleaning the floor. However, 
that could be a false negative. So let's say this tile floor that I'm looking at right now, okay, that is a dirty tile floor. When I'm looking at it, those, those dirty spots, it turns out that's not actually dirty spots. What that is, is that's the pigment, the ink inside the tile. That's the way the tile was made. So what that means is, again, I screwed up. I made a mistake. I wasn't testing what I thought I was testing because I thought I was trying to clean the dirty floor. Well, the floor is not dirty. It's already clean. Those aren't dirt spots. That's the, the pigment, the ink inside the tile. So again, I screwed up. I made a mistake. So what I need to do is I need to add another bucket. Bucket number five is going to be my positive control. Okay, the positive control is something that must give you a positive result. It has to give you the thing you're looking for. In this case, I'm looking for a clean floor. So let's say I use pure bleach. Pure bleach should clean a dirty floor. All right, so now I redo my experiment. And I have my water bucket. That's my negative control. And let's say it does not clean the floor. I have my bleach bucket, my positive control. It does clean the floor. What that tells me now is I have designed my experiment correctly. And then the other three buckets, those are going to be called the experimental buckets, the ones that have Pine Salt Fabulous and Mr. Clean inside them. They either will or won't clean the floor, depending on whether those chemicals are doing a good job cleaning the floor. Okay, so that's what a negative and a positive control are. The negative control always has to give you a negative result. It does not give you the thing you're looking for. The positive control always has to give you a positive result. It always has to give you the thing you're looking for. All right, so those are negative and positive controls. And when you do science, you always use control groups to make sure you didn't screw up. That's the main purpose of control groups, to make sure you didn't make a mistake. Scientists, we're humans, just like everybody else, we make mistakes, but we check ourselves and we determine that if we made a mistake, we go back and we fix it. We fix the problem. Okay, but that's the main purpose of controls to make sure you're doing the experiment correctly. Okay, so the next thing we need to talk about in regards to your little introduction to science is some of the terminology, some of the, the words that are used in science. And it turns out that a lot of the times the general public does not actually understand the scientific definition of a word. Okay, for example, I'm going to use a physics example because a lot of times it's easier to think about things moving rather than like chemicals or DNA or cells. So in a physics example, you all know the word acceleration. Everyone knows what acceleration means. You're in your car, you put the gas pedal down, you're speeding up, okay, you're accelerating. So everyone knows what acceleration means is it means to speed up. That's what acceleration means. However, acceleration is actually a scientific term. It's a physics term. And if you were to ask a physicist, what does acceleration mean? They would tell you acceleration means to speed up or to slow down or to keep the same speed but change direction. That's what acceleration actually means. Acceleration is a change in speed, so that could be an increase or a decrease, or a change in direction. If you're in your car and your cruise control is set at 50 miles per hour, but you're going around a curve, even though your speed is not changing, you're accelerating, because acceleration is a change in speed or a change in direction. That's what it actually means. But Nobody in the general public knows that. Everyone thinks that acceleration means to speed up. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that. It means to speed up or to slow down or to change direction. So it's actually, it's kind of okay that there are different definitions for words in science versus the general public. However, if you're taking a physics course, you need to know the actual scientific definition of the word acceleration. You need to know what it really means. Okay, so another example of a word that is always misused among the general public, and this applies to all science, okay, not just physics or biology, it's all science, but it definitely applies to biology, is the word theory. People do not understand what the word theory means because it is always misused among the general public. And it's misused in two different ways. One way 
the word theory is misused is you might have heard somebody say or you might have said yourself I have a working theory okay there is no such thing as a working theory okay because when you say I have a working theory what you're saying is this is what I think is happening this is my best guess is what I think is going on that is not a theory you already learned what that was that's a hypothesis so when you say I have a working theory what you mean to actually say is I have a hypothesis so please never say working theory again because there's no such thing as a working theory that's a hypothesis that is not what a theory is okay so if the theory is not your best guess if it's not what you think is happening then what is a theory okay well theory is a very well tested explanation for a set of results Okay, that is not a hypothesis. That is not your best guess. A hypothesis is what you think is happening, but you haven't tested yet. Okay, a theory has already been tested and hasn't been tested once. It's well tested, meaning it's been tested hundreds or thousands of times. Okay, so it's not a guess like a hypothesis. It's already been tested. A theory also explains something. It tells you how something is happening. Okay, so that is not a hypothesis, that's a theory, okay, which is very different from a hypothesis. Okay, so an example of this, and again back to physics for an example, the kinetic theory of matter. The kinetic theory of matter states that all atoms are constantly moving, they never stop moving. And the kinetic theory of matter explains lots of things. It explains things like um, what is temperature? Because temperature is not really just I feel hot or I feel cold. Temperature is actually doing is measuring how fast your atoms are moving. It explains why gas has pressure. Like when why when you add gas to a balloon, why does a balloon get larger? Okay. The kinetic theory of matter explains lots of things. And it's been very well tested. The kinetic theory of matter has been around for well more than 100 years. At this point, it has literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of evidence that support the kinetic theory of matter. Okay, but it's a theory. And this is the second way this term theory is always misused among the general public. Because you might have heard somebody say that something is only a theory. If somebody says that something is only a theory, what it means is they have no idea what the word theory means. Because when they're saying something is only a theory, what they're implying is it's only a theory, it's not a fact. It's only a theory, it's never been proven. Okay, well that tells you they don't know what the word theory means. Because no theory has ever been proven. No theory will ever be proven. It's not allowed to be proven. For example, gravity is a theory. Gravity will forever and always remain a theory. Okay, so theories can't be proven. Okay, so what happens to them instead is as they stand the test of time, they become stronger and stronger theories. The kinetic theory of matter has been around for more than 100 years, hundreds of thousands of pieces of evidence that support it. It's a very strong theory, okay? But you can't say it's been proven, okay? Even though in my heart of hearts, deep down inside, I know the kinetic theory of, of matter is a fact, okay? But I, as a scientist, I can't say that. I say it's a theory, okay? And it turns out theory is as big as it gets in science. There is nothing bigger than a theory. That's the other way when somebody says something is only a theory, they don't know what theory means because they think that there should be something bigger than that. There's nothing bigger than a theory in science. A theory is as big as it can possibly get. Okay, so that's what a theory is. The next definition is called a law, and that's going to sound like it just completely lied to you because a law sounds like something that is a fact or has been proven. Okay, a law and a theory are two completely different things. Okay, a theory explains something, whereas a law is an observation. So, for example, if I take my pen here and I let go of my pen, it's going to fall towards the earth. That is the law of gravity. The fact that the pen is going to fall towards the ground, that's the law of gravity. But if you notice, all that was was an observation. The pen is going to fall. Well, who the hell cares that the pen's going to fall? Why is the pen going to fall? 
the reason why the pen is going to fall is the theory of gravity. So a law is an observation, whereas a theory is an explanation. So theories do not become laws. They are two different things. In fact, between the two, a theory is bigger than a law because a law just observes, a theory explains. Okay, so we have a hypothesis. It's your best guess is what you think is happening. We have a theory. It's a very well-tested explanation for a set of results. And then we have a law, which is an observation of something you observe. Okay, so the last definition for science is, that we're going to talk about today is a model. A model makes it easier to understand something that might be too difficult to observe directly. Okay, so for example, let's say I tell you, right now I want you to go step outside and I want you to picture the relative distance and direction between like a semi and England and India. Okay, well you can't do that. Because the Earth is too big. So you can't picture the relative distance and direction between those three locations. But what you can do is you can get a model of the Earth. You've all seen one. It's called a globe. And then using that model of the Earth, you glo the globe, you can easily picture the relative distance and direction between those three locations. So a model makes it easier to understand something is too big to directly observe. Or more applicable to biology, something that's too small to directly observe. For example, atoms. We can't see an atom. They're too small to see. But we have models to help us describe atoms so we can understand them. Or even more applicable to biology, we have things called model organisms. Okay, a model organism is a species that's not human, like flies or mice, that we use to understand humans. Okay, so for example, we study human cancer in mice. We study human Parkinson's disease in fruit flies. So these would be model organisms. Now, first, why would you do that? Like a, a mouse is not the same as a human. A fly is not the same as a human. Well, there's a lot of experiments that you cannot feasibly or ethically do in humans, but you can more easily do in something like a fruit fly. Like, I can't give you Parkinson's disease to test my new drug that I think is going to help people with Parkinson's disease. Again, that would not be ethical to do. But most of you are not going to care if I give a fruit fly Parkinson's disease to try to find a cure for human Parkinson's disease. So we do it in these other species because there's a lot of experiments we just cannot do in humans. It's not ethical. Um, that's why we would do it. Why can we do it? You know, a fruit fly is not a human. A mouse is not a human. However, we are surprisingly, shockingly similar to everything else that's alive on this planet. If you were to take a cell from a fly and a cell from a mouse and a cell from a human and put them on a microscope slide underneath a microscope and look at them, you couldn't tell the difference. They look the same. They have the same structures, things we're going to learn about this semester, things like the nucleus, the plasma membrane. They're built out of the same components. Again, things we're going to learn about this semester, things like um, carbohydrates and lipids and DNA and proteins. Okay, You couldn't tell the difference. Uh, we're even the, the same in the way we store information. Okay, We store information in our DNA. So does a fruit fly. So does a mouse. We read the information in the same way. Like, um, if you were to, for example, let's say, take, take a gene out of a human, a piece of DNA out of a human, and put that DNA into, like, a yeast cell, that yeast will use that gene in the same way because it reads the DNA the same as we read it. And we'll talk about that later in the semester. Okay, but we are shockingly similar to everything else alive on this planet. Now, why is that? That has to do with descent from a common ancestor and evolution, which is not the main focus of Bio 1, but we'll talk about it briefly in the first chapter. But because we're so similar to everything else, we can use the other species as model organisms to help us to understand humans and find cures for human diseases. Okay, so those are examples of scientific models. Okay, and that wraps up my little introduction to science. Okay, now... After that, after this, we're going to talk about chapter one.